welcome to Speechless. Glad to have you here live from the SEC studio in White Bear Lake and also uh, live uh, in St. Paul. Um, got a fascinating, this is a special edition of Speechless. We got a fascinating show. This, there was a press conference in, uh, at the Capitol, at the press conference room, uh, State Office Building 181, about uh, voter fraud. Uh, ineligible voters specifically, people that the Secretary of State knew were ineligible and allowed to vote anyway. Fascinating. You're going to want to watch this because we got tons of video on this presentation. Andy Selick, uh, Executive Director of Minnesota Voter Alliance, Voters Alliance uh, gave a great presentation along with the attorney Eric Cardle. And um, we're, we're just going to dig into this because uh, there's a lot of information and we want to make sure you get it. But tell your friends, hey, you know, you, you need to find out what's going on. This is amazing. And it's scary. And how our government treats our Constitution and its citizens in these elections. Boy, you may hear comments like, uh, we got third world country going on here as far as election goes in Minnesota. And there's a possibility that some of our high ranking officials like Senator Klobuchar and Keith Ellison are uh, promoting this third world country elections that we have here in Minnesota trying to make it to a national level. You know, to me, this, this is uh, uh, really, really bad behavior. So let's get into this. Okay, first of all, you're going to have Andy Seelick kind of explaining the history of what took place to get us to where we are today with this lawsuit. And why this lawsuit? It's a unique lawsuit. Okay, so you're going to want to stay and listen to why it's unique. So let's uh, watch this video. Oh, we don't got any sound in here. There was a problem is when we started studying the statutes and what happened or what happens regarding same day voter registration. As many of you may know, there's only a handful of states in the union that have same day registration. And Minnesota is one of those states. What happens in Minnesota? Most people are alarmed when they hear how Minnesota handles their uh, same day voter registration. In presidential election years, an average of 540,000 people in Minnesota register on election day and vote. And one of the things we learned is that the voter registration applications that those people fill out are not even entered into the statewide voter registration system, the SVRS, until 42 days, up to 42 days after the election. Okay, isn't that amazing? Uh, the same day registration, it's a problem. And it, it's, you know, 500,000 people voting. So, and, and they don't know who these people are that are voting. They're being vouched for, various things like that. And the Secretary of State is, has up to 42 days to, to verify. Okay, but is that right? Is that the our legal way? Is that what our Constitution and statutes say? Well, I'll, I'll have Andy explain, uh, Mr. Selig explain some more of the uh, history taking place. So all the checking and the, and the eligibility verification that the Secretary of State does, Mark Ritchie admitted um, approximately a year ago that they, in a, in a Capitol Report interview, that they do eight different checks to eight different databases. They make sure they're not a felon. They make sure they're not under guardianship as mentally incompetent. They make sure they're a citizen. Eight different checks, plus they send out a PVC postal verification card. So the, gov the Secretary of State does nine different checks for anybody who pre-registers 20 days before the election. So when, when, when the people of Minnesota hear that 540,000 people aren't even being checked until months after the elections and the elections are certified, they are alarmed. And that's really what we have, why we have dug and dug and dug and dug. 
to identify the problem, which I believe that we have done. Well, that right there, that is just amazing. You know, same day registrations. Now we got a solid uh, system here for those that pre-register and are checked, right? It, it seems like it, but 500,000 that really aren't checked Okay, we're going to find out more about that, um, and that's where we're going to get into here. Basically, now uh, Mr. Selick is going to make an announcement about a lawsuit uh, against the Secretary of State, and um, so, I mean, the numbers are going to end up being staggering as to what you hear in in, in this uh, in in this press conference. So let's go to the next announce, uh, the beginning of the announcement. We're announcing today the filing of our legal challenge against Secretary of State Steve Simon and county election uh, directors from Hennepin and Ramsey County for uh, election officials for entitling and permitting persons to vote who are known to be ineligible by the state. That is the key in our lawsuit. We're not targeting people they don't know anything about. We're targeting people that they do know something about, and I'll cover that in just a, mo a moment. This petition is being filed under the Minnesota Errors and Omissions Statute against the Secretary of State regarding wrongful acts, which, quote, out of the statute, have occurred and are about to occur again. Article 7, Section 1 of the Minnesota Constitution categorically and expressly prohibits certain individuals from being entitled and permitted to vote and I handed out the Minnesota Constitution. Did everybody get a copy? It's pretty uh, uh, crystal clear what the Minnesota Constitution, your Constitution, says. On election day, the Secretary of State wrongfully directs, instructs, demands that election judges, via the election judge guide, tells them to permit persons known to be ineligible to vote such as non-citizens, convicted felons, we'll talk about that in a minute, and vulnerable persons who have been exploited by political predators who have been found by a court to be mentally incompetent to vote, comma, as long as they swear they're eligible. I wish I had more time to get into that issue. <laughs> I, that, that's just amazing to me. So the Secretary of State, understand this, Secretary of State knows these people are ineligible to vote and they let them vote. And all they have to do is, all the voter has to do is swear that they're eligible. Even though they know they're not eligible and they get to vote. It's amazing. So we have this constitution that says one thing, these people can't vote. We have a secretary of state that says, I don't care. It's been going on since 2008. I don't care. We're going to let them vote anyway. And good luck. <laughs> you know, how do you really know if you won your election? You can't know. Okay. So bi big issue. Um, <clears throat> All right, let's go to the, uh, uh, continue on with the announcement. Without any legal authority, election officials allow the self-certification to supersede an adjudicated court order. Despite the court order, election officials reinstate the right to vote and permit the person to cast a ballot and have their ballot counted, despite of a court's order. See, now... Boy, we, now we've entered a different uh, jurisdiction here, okay? We got the executive branch with the Secretary of State. Now we're bringing up the issue that there is a court order that a judge said this person cannot vote because they are a felon, okay? That's what that means. You're a felon. You don't get to vote. And the Secretary of State is just thumbing their nose at these judges, and saying, I don't care what, I con uh, what your court order says, I'm going to let them vote anyway. And not only that, 
the Secretary of State is thumbing their nose at the people of Minnesota because our Constitution and statutes say otherwise. This is huge. This is really, really huge. All right, let's go to the third part of the announcement. When the Minnesota Constitution says that felons, and you folks, I believe, have a copy of this, shall not be entitled or permitted to have a vote at, to vote at any election in this state, it must mean something. When Minnesota Statute 201061 says that ineligible persons may not register, it must mean something. And when judges throughout the state restrict the right to vote of those convicted of a felony, that too must mean something. <laughs> uh, Mr. Selig, no. According to Steve Simon and Mark Ritchie, it means nothing. It means nothing. And right now, it continues to mean nothing because they haven't changed their ways. And as things look right now, are not going to change their ways. Now, fortunately, some of the county prosecutors, once they've been informed by citizens that felons have voted, some of these prosecutors have reluctantly prosecuted felons that have voted. And it's a gross misdemeanor, by the way. <laughs> okay, it's not a felony to vote if you're a felon. It's a gross misdemeanor to vote if you're a felon, which is less than a, a felony charge. Okay, so does it mean something? Does our Constitution and a, uh, statutes mean anything? You know, I, I think not, at least to the Secretary of State. All right, let's go uh, to the fourth part of the announcement. The Secretary of State's actions contradict the express language in the Minnesota Constitution, which I just handed out to you a few minutes ago. Even if a statute or policy allows a person to self-certify in the belief that they're, el that they're eligible, the certification cannot be a governmental justification to permit the person to vote because the election official knows of the judicial adjudication that the person does not have the right to vote. Thus, under the Minnesota Constitution, the court ordered restricted right, right, the court took away their right, precludes any official from violating or from considering the person an elector. Yeah, in, in other words, an election judge can't let somebody that they know, and they know, they can't let somebody that's a felon vote, even if they swear to it that they're not. You can't let them vote. The Secretary of State knows who these people are, and it's his duty to get it to the election judges. And <clears throat> now whether that's happening or not may be another issue. Okay, but um, that's the Secretary of State responsibility. That's what we told them. In our Constitution, this is your duty, and it's one of your primary duties. You know what? And the big problem is once these felons vote, or anybody else ineligible, can't be undone. Our process in our state means it can't be undone because we do it wrong. We haven't made provisions, common sense provisions, that would right this wrong. And we're going to get to that the, uh, later on. Okay, let's go to the uh, next clip. Minnesota statutes require government agencies to report to the Secretary of State those persons who have been convicted of a felony, as Susan well knows, right? We've done a lot of homework on this. Susan uh, has worked a lot with, on, on the felon voting with us. Um, so the Secretary of State, the state agencies, such as the Court Administrator and the Department of Corrections, are, are required by statute, 20115, 155, to do what? To send lists regularly to the Secretary of State of all persons who have been adjudicated a felon and have lost their voting, their right to vote, okay? And in Minnesota, that right is lost until they finish their sentence, okay? That's kind of another issue, but that's, the policy, and we think that's a good policy. When a felon proves that they can uh, live by the same laws we're all 
ha having to live by, then they can vote. Some states take them away for good, those voting rights. All right. So the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension has a list of all whose felons. So does the judiciary have a list of all whose felons. Both branches, the judiciary and the executive branch, or the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, is supposed to send that information to the Secretary of State. And guess what? They do. Secretary of State has the information. We're going to see an analogy later on in this, in this press conference that will blow your mind away. So I don't, we don't want to hear that the Secretary of State can't do this. There isn't a way to do it because there are, they already do it. We'll find out how. All right, let's go to the next uh, clip. The Secretary of State and election officials attain knowledge of persons with court-restricted re court rights to vote and the same under guardianship. For example, data received from the state court administrator, we were able to get data from the state court administrator, shows 105,000 felony convictions since 2003 were sent to the Secretary of State. Those notices were sent between 2003 and 2014. Yet, notwithstanding the election officials' knowledge of those court orders, which we have a box, oh, we have a box and Eric will talk about that, the attained knowledge is abandoned on election day. In other words, they ignore it. That's how Minnesota handles uh, uh, people with restricted voting rights. 105,000 felons that have been set to the Secretary of State since 2003. A lot of information, big deal. Secretary of State handles millions of voting registrations every year. I mean, how many people vote? We, we got at least, a, I think, a couple million people voting in Minnesota. So it, the numbers isn't the problem. 100,000 isn't the problem. It's the will to do what the people have told them to do. Okay, I mean, this, this is just stunning. This is... Let's go to the uh, next part of the announcement that, uh, let's play that clip. The state's own data reveal the magnitude of persons without the right to vote statewide can be significant and capable of influence election results and usurping the will of the people. We learned from one of our many Data Practice Act requests, we had a Data Practice Act request that we submitted after the 2008 election. 542,000 people registered on election day. We wanted to know of those people, specifically of the people who registered on election day, how many of those people 12, 18 months later, after they've gone through the checking process, albeit too late to influence the election, how many of them had their status, their voter status in the SVRS changed from to something other than active? The, the statewide voter registration system all of you people, I assume, are eligible voters, so you would all be in the system and, and, and active. When the state does their checks, if they find out you're a felon, the Secretary of State sends that to the county auditor, and then you're marked challenged on the roster, challenged felon or challenged residents or whatever the case may be. 17,000 same-day registrants after the election were marked challenged. They wouldn't tell us who they were. They would only give us the aggregate number. Folks, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. The U.S. Senate, Obamacare, was decided by those 300 votes. So that's significant. And we're not here complaining about that. What we're here for is election integrity so that people in Minnesota can have confidence in their election results, not like some third world country, which is what we have today. Can you believe what you just heard? I mean, this should make you livid. 17,000 ineligible voters, challenged voters in that election. They got out of those 500,000, they got to vote. 17,000 came back challenged, meaning they weren't supposed to be voting. 
Now here's the other thing if you didn't catch. What, what did Aunt, Mr. Selick say about getting those names? This is a public record. This is something that the citizens of Minnesota are entitled to have and they can't get the records. Well, oh, 17,000. We'll give you the number. I mean, that's enough to, you know, blow your mind. But you put on top of it, the icing on the cake is, oh, we're not going to let you know. Why? Because we don't want to, even though they're required by law. This is your Secretary of State. Unbelievable. So what do you do? You got these 17,000 people. How do you find out who they are? Can you find out some of them? Well, I, I, think, they, I, I think they've done some of that. But let's watch the next clip. The appendix in our lawsuit contains over 5,000 pages of documents, if you can believe that. That's one of the boxes right there that Eric will talk about. 5,000 pages were scanned in. And they'll be available on our website in the next probably 48 hours, which you, you folks will be able to see everything. Um, and including those documents, affidavits, over a dozen affidavits, and other supporting evidence, such as court records on several thousand felons who voted illegally, that we've identified in 2008, 10, 12, and 14, which we're finding out has grown, actually. And those actual numbers will come out tomorrow, because those were all just scanned in, and now they're double and triple checking everything, so it should be all done in the next uh, day or two. According to the state court administrator, approximately, or only, 250 of those felons were convicted of voting ineligibly. Folks, do you know why you, you hear a lot about voter fraud is low in Minnesota? Do you know why? Why is because the only way to get convicted of voter fraud is, in Minnesota is if you're stupid enough to admit that you shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry to say that, but that's <laughs> the law in Minnesota. So of those, uh, of those uh, people who were convicted uh, or, or who voted ineligibly, 250 approximately uh, admitted that they shouldn't have done it. So maybe they're just good, honest people. I take that other word back. Okay. Uh, but that's still a lot of people that the state had to spend taxpayer money on going to convict them. If they would do what we're simply asking is don't give them a ballot. Save, not only uh, improve the credibility and integrity of our elections, but save taxpayer money at the same time. There you go. Don't give them a ballot. That's, that's pretty easy. That would save a lot, a lot of money. And, you know, it, it is written in the law. And a lot of laws are written this way. You have to knowingly, knowingly intended. You know, you could have done it by accident, therefore you wouldn't have violated that law. A lot of laws are that way. Don't count on it, you know, when you're doing this stuff. Because you could go into the courtroom and say, I didn't know. I was unaware. You know, and in this law, you get off the hook. Okay, so um, 250,000 didn't. But why put those 250, 250 people into that spot? Why, in a sense, it's almost uh, an entrapment by the Secretary of State. You know, I'm not going to do my job. I want you to vote so that you can get convicted of a gross misdemeanor. Now, they didn't say that in the press conference. I just came up with that right now. But what, what, what are they doing? Why is the Secretary of State behaving this way, trying to get people in trouble? That's the net effect of it, isn't it? Wow. You know, so 17,000 votes. Voters that were challenged, shouldn't have voted. How many elections are decided by one vote? 41 vote. And one of the other testifiers we're not going to get to here, one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit we're not going to get to on the uh, show here, uh, was a state representative, Kurt Stansrud, who lost his election by 41 votes. So he's the plaintiff saying, hey, uh, I still don't know to this day whether I won or lost my election or won it or not because the Secretary of State didn't do their job. And we had more than 41 
um, um, challenged ballots in our area. We don't know how they voted. You know, that's why you don't let them vote. Okay, let's go to the next clip. But the only reason those 250 were, uh, were convicted was, number one, that the felon had to admit that they knew they did it illegally and because of the great work that Dan McGrath and Minnesota Majority did, uh, digging into those databases and doing extensive comparisons, and we've done the same thing for 12, where they had to get the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension database, the whole BCA database, and the entire SVRS, and have a professional database person match them. Very sophisticated stuff. And, uh, and then when they matched, they double, triple, checked them, then they sent them to the county uh, auditors, or the county attorneys. And, 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 and if it's not for Dan's work on that and, and his group, there wouldn't have been any convictions. So, and, and, and we even, on our radio show at the Ramsey County Fair, we had John Choi on, and he admitted it's just not a priority for them. Their, their number one priority as a Secretary of State, and or one of their top priorities constitutionally, is that. And then there, voter integrity, and they say it's not a priority. Yeah, it has to be a priority. It is your priority. We said it's your priority. So make it your priority by our Constitution and our statutes. I remember hearing, oh, there's no voter fraud in Minnesota. Oh, it's so small. You know, we don't even know. Uh, nobody's been convicted. You know, that was before 250 got convicted. Therefore, it doesn't exist. You know, of course, that's uh, the governmental process of hearing different voices to try to dissuade, discourage, or encourage people to do something or not do something. So that's part of it. But you know that's a total baloney by these people. That Anybody that's saying there's not a voter problem and there's voter fraud problem and it's not significant, it, th those people you shouldn't listen to. I, I mean, they're deceivers. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to the next clip. I think we're on 10, so just double check there. So just to be clear, our primary interest is not about voter fraud, folks. It's to stop ineligible voting. I mean, regardless if a person knows or doesn't know if they're eligible. Our petition seeks an injunction against the Secretary of State and election officials requiring them to stop providing ballots to persons known not to have the right to vote uh, under a court restriction, stop counting any ballot of a person who has a, hit a right, his or her right to vote court restricted, and three, on election day, prohibit the use of self-certification, in other words, the oath, as a basis for permitting persons who have been identified by state agencies to the Secretary of State or other election officials as known to have their right to vote court restricted. Oh, sounds reasonable to me. Why, why can't we do that? Well, I think we can. So, uh, but let's just stop the voting, okay? You stop the voting, the other things, you stop these challenge ineligible people from voting, these other things fall into place. Uh, but you need to have back, backups in the system, and I think that's what uh, uh, number two and three were in his um, solution. Stop counting these ballots, and then stop having self-verification, um, swearing an oath. Uh, you know, have more verification than that on same-day registration, same as you do as if you signed up 20 days ahead of time. And provisional ballots, I think it would be a great solution for this, because you don't count the ballots until you know the person's eligible to begin with, because that's what our Constitution says anyway. Only eligible people can vote. So you have to certify beforehand that they're eligible. And our Secretary of State is not doing that. Okay, let's go to the next clip. Our petition is narrow in scope, as I was explaining Dale a minute ago. Very narrow, seeking to cure state and county election officials specific wrongful acts involving only those persons known to have their right to vote court restricted. So that's what this lawsuit is targeted on. Um, the petition does not reach, nor does it attempt to reach, issues regarding treatment 
by government officials or any other class of persons, such as those persons who have the right to vote or those persons whose right to vote uh, is unknown. In this petition, we also propose simple, effective, comprehensive, inexpensive corrections for these errors, such as simply implementing a system that is currently used to check if someone voted absentee. Persons with court-restricted voting rights are just as ineligible as someone who voted absentee, if you think about it, right? For all you election judges in the room, when someone votes absentee ballot, they'll take and they'll put AB on the poll roster. So if that person comes in to vote, they'll say, sorry, Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith, you already voted absentee, you're not getting a ballot today, okay? To, to us, to me, there's no difference in that person than the person who has a court, the judicial system has taken away that person's right to vote. Are they, are they any differently ineligible? And, and so, so we already have a system in place. They don't have to spend a lot of money implementing what we're asking for. There it is. Unbelievable. Now your, your head should have, oh, why didn't I think of that? You realize how many absentee voters vote? I mean, you know, register and go through a process. Hundreds of thousands absentee voters every year. And guess what? Our system can handle it. And so these people are checked, and if they voted absentee, there it goes on the voting register. They already voted absentee ballot. When they, if they show up to vote on election day, the election judge will say, no, you don't get to vote. I won't say it that way, <laughs> but you know, they're told, no, you already voted, okay? And the person goes, oh, oh yeah, I forgot. You know, whatever, <laughs> okay? They don't get to vote. People are turned down from voting on election day. Oh my goodness, that can't happen. Yes, it happens all the time if you voted absentee ballot. So they have a system. So all they have to do is apply the same thing to felon votings. Oh, challenged. Oh, you can't vote if you show up. You're challenged, sorry. Okay, uh, but we'll do a provisional ballot in case you have a, you're, you're, you're really not challenged, but somebody messed up in the paperwork. Okay, wow. Everybody's constitutional rights are protected. What a simple way to do it. And it's already set up. Okay, so let's hear the close of what... Uh, Mr. Selick has to say on his uh, announcement. I have always felt strongly that America is the greatest country in the world. That's why I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. That was a long time ago. But to this day, I still get chills down my spine when I hear the Marine Corps hymn or the Star Spangled Banner. Election integrity is vital for America to continue its greatness. I'd like to close with a quote from Hennepin County District Court Judge Jay Quam. What he said in a 2012 case regarding guardianship and assessing wards uh, as mentally incompetent in voting, in which we played a major role in that. For all the, this is from Jay Quam, for all the blood spilled and the lives lost to preserve key tenets of our democracy, such as the right to vote. You ready for this? Courts must do their part to protect the integrity of each vote. This is the key. This is from Jay Kwam. The court's obligation to the ele electoral process is twofold. Okay, two things. One, courts must ensure that every citizen entitled to vote is allowed to do so. How could anybody argue with that? Anything less deprives that citizen of a fundamental right and it deprives the citizenry of a true democracy. Number two, courts must also ensure that no person votes who is not eligible to vote. Pretty simple stuff, right? Anything less, Quam goes on to say, dilutes the fundamental rights of the proper electorate and it likewise deprives the citizenry of a true democracy. So folks, very soon, the Minnesota Supreme Court will have the opportunity to weigh in on this important issue and fulfill 
that obligation that Judge Quam talks about to the electoral process. Thank you. Wow. Great, great press conference, great introduction uh, to the issue going on here. Now, uh, and Judge Quam got it right. Courts must do their part in those two ways that Mr. Selick expressed. Now what's happened in the press conference, uh, a couple other people spoke, some of the plaintiffs, but now uh, we're, we're skipping forward to where Eric Carl, the attorney the, in the lawsuit for Minnesota Voters Alliance, uh, talks about the judicial aspect of this case. And so uh, let's hear his first comments under uh, collapse. My name is uh, Eric Cardall, and uh, for the, those that of you who don't know me, um, I think the Winona Daily got it right recently. They said he's a lawyer who made a career out of suing the government, and uh, that'll, that'll probably end up being my eulogy. So anyway, so uh, for you that know me, of course, I've beat the government in 25 different subject areas. This includes townships, counties, school districts, uh, the, the state, the federal government, you name it, I've sued it and I beat them in different subject areas. And so how this works with uh, dedicated organizations and clients like Andy is I have clients who are patriots. They care about government operating well, they see a problem, and they research, they research, they research. This is the formula when they, they come to me with a, a legal issue and we vet and we vet and we vet. This has taken four or five years. This is a lawsuit where we're not new to the subject area and neither is the government. Um, um, uh, two or three lawsuits have preceded this one on similar related issues, and we've learned from those lawsuits. The courts have learned from those lawsuits. Uh, Judge Quam was quoted here. Judge Quam recognizes the importance of court-restricted voting rights, those court orders being respected by our administrative officials. So let's get this right, that the state judiciary says this person can't vote, and then over here the Secretary of State and the election judges let them vote. Is that the type of country we want? And we're a country that builds, uh, that rebuilds the I-35 bridge when it collapses. We send up a space shuttle after one collapses, right? Well, we have an election system that's collapsed, but we just don't let it go. We rebuild. That's why we rebuilt the bridge. That's why we sent the, the shuttle up again. And so we have to decide to rebuild right now. And we build that around election integrity, which Minnesota Voters Alliance has defended since the beginning. So now we're filing an errors and omissions petition in the Minnesota Supreme Court. That means when we file the petition with the supporting database that Andy talked about, there's just going to be one hearing in the Minnesota Supreme Court, and the Minnesota Supreme Court gets to decide. Now why does the Minnesota Supreme Court have original jurisdiction? Well, statute provides for that, and we have to point out the error and omission in the system. Wow. There you go. Uh, very, very well said. I mean, he, he's just blowing it out of the park here. I mean, he's hitting home runs left and right with his statements. Court orders must be respected. Of course, is the court order that a judge issues, is it constitutional in itself? Now, we get in that problem, as you've seen in my past show, where Del Nathan had a court order that said, uh, oh, you gotta disclose attorney-client privilege. And Del Nathan said, no, I'm not gonna disclose that. And so the full weight of the Minnesota judicial system came down on Del Nathan for an illegal court order and they suspended his license. They're willing to do that. The Minnesota judicial system is willing to back a court order, a fraudulent court order to the extent of uh, hurting an individual in their occupation and business and taking away their license because he protected his constitutional right from a bad judge. So now we got all these court orders, over a hundred thousand court orders by judges saying, you felons, you've lost your right to vote. And will the judiciary stand up and say, we mean our court orders and we're going to enforce them in a situation where they actually have validity to enforce them versus one where they don't have validity to enforce them. So 
we'll see what happens. But I kind of think the challenge is out there for the uh, courts to come through. All right, let's go on to the next part of uh, Mr. Cardle's ex explanation. Well, after all this vetting, think of how narrow this claim is. Less is more. This is so narrow, right? It's narrow in the sense there are court orders that say this person cannot vote. Right, the consequence of a felony conviction is the felon cannot vote. And then they're allowed to vote under the self-certification method. Now, under the law, the court administrator and these other agencies report the ineligible felons to the Secretary of State over across the hall. That information doesn't get down to the election judges to stop those people from voting. They can still vote by self-certification. Now, we're, the law, which Andy read, is very clear. In statute, in the court order, in the Constitution, felons will not be permitted to vote. So this isn't about law. This is about the Secretary of State making excuses about allowing ineligible felons to vote, or ineligible wards under guardianship orders restricting their right to vote. It's about the same thing. What the Secretary of State will tell you, and you should not believe him, is that the Secretary of State will say it's all very complicated and we can't follow court orders. I mean, sure, the, the, the court administrator and these other agencies send us the court orders. Sure, we recognize that these people can't vote, but that person's showing up and voting. Just like Andy was saying, it would be like, I grew up in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. What if the, the, the city of Wabasso and the residents there were allowed to vote twice? Well, we'd all be up in arms. That can't happen. My vote's being diluted. Well, these felons aren't supposed to vote once and they're being allowed to vote. When in the 2008 race, there were 800 admitted felons who voted and the margin of victory for Mr. Franken was 312 votes. When we look back, the problem has not decreased, it's increased. Someone's winning elections because felons are voting. Wow, <laughs> these are powerful statements. Very, very powerful statements. So uh, I think he's, I really don't have anything to add to that comment. I mean, he's hitting it on the nail on the head. Hey, go to, you know, you're going to want to watch this again. You're going to want to let people know uh, about this. So this will be up on youtube.com forward slash speechless MN within a couple days. So you can watch it. Tell your friends, go there, watch this show because you're going to see some powerful, powerful stuff. All right, let's go to the next uh comments that Mr. Carlo made. Uh, Mr. Stensrud here doesn't know after his close election whether he lost among eligible voters because his, his, poll, his uh, electorate is polluted with ineligible voters. With respect to gathering the data for this lawsuit, no cooperation with the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State knows these ineligible voters are voting because they're noted inactive in the next state uh, registration system check but that information wouldn't be shared with us because that'd make it too easy for us. So what we had to do is do reverse engineering. Here's the box. Here. So why, why are court restricted, <laughs> court restricted voters easier to prove than non-citizens uh, non and these other things? Is because there are court registers on the computer. So you can go to the court register for every voter in Minnesota and you can determine whether they're ineligible to vote because of the felony conviction. Right? We can do that. But we pay the court administrator and other officials to do it for us and tell the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State doesn't communi communicate to the election judge and won't share the information with us, so we have to do it this way. This is why we're going to win the lawsuit. It's because people see what's happening. People see that there are election registers and these people are felons. Then they see rosters uh, where they voted and how is it that people vote when there's a court order saying they're restricted to vote? Well, I mean, if that is an indictment against the Secretary of State and a hoorah for the people that went out and had to dig through this, costing thousands of dollars to do this research, you know, and our elected elected officials are not doing their job, it's, it's pretty poor. And um, Eric Cardle hit it. I mean, yeah, they reversed engineered. Took two different databases and merged them together and then went further into the system and, and uh, 
Wow, it was amazing what they discovered. I have a situation here. I'm actually not going to bring it up. The guy's name isn't important in this case. He, was, he voted ineligibly in 2010, was convicted early on in 2012, went out, still a felon, went out and voted again in 2012. The Secretary of State knew this, yet he was still went out and voted. Hasn't been convicted yet the second time around. Unbelievable <laughs> what took place. All right, let's watch the next clip. And we know that judges, and they should, think that the world depends in part on court orders, right? Where am I going? I'm going to judges. And judges think court orders are important, right? Of course they do. And, and the judges are going to say that the consequences of court orders are important. Of course they, they are. And so the justices of the Minnesota Supreme Court are going to look us all in the face and say, well, of course our court orders must be upheld by administrative officials administering the elections. All right. You would think. Okay. Let's go to the next clip. And so all we've done, all Andy's done, is gone to the, the computer system. He's pulled up all these court orders saying these people are restricted, ineligible to vote, and then he's proving that they voted. And it's polluted the election contest since at least 2008 where our research goes back. And as Andy said, we're talking about thousands of ineligible voters 2008 through 2014, but there shouldn't be one. And it's a problem that's been raised over and over again to our government. And here we have the people taking a shot. That is a petition, uh, Arizona Mission petition, petition to the Minnesota Supreme Court to manage the government out of its illegality, right? So it's a cultural problem. The government has a cultural problem and they don't see a problem, the Secretary of State doesn't see a problem with ineligible felons voting and determining elections. We the people say no, there is a problem with that. So we're gonna use this route, this little petition, this paperwork, we're gonna present to the court and everyone in this room agrees with me that ineligible voters should not be allowed to vote. So if everyone in Minnesota agrees, except the Secretary of State, <laughs> that ineligible voters should not be allowed to vote, then we're going to win this petition, right? Well, it's not that easy, right? You know, it's not that easy. And the reason it's not that easy is that it's, it's difficult, it's challenging for a court to hold the government accountable to law. And we understand that. It's a difficult job being a judge, but when we lay out things so well, so simply, we would hope that the court would do the right thing. Well, there's, there's a challenge to the court right there. Are you going to do the right thing? This is pretty simple. It's laid out very well. We've done everything we're supposed to do. We've been in multiple lawsuits, so we know what you're thinking. You, we've followed your regulations uh, that you've created. And so what are you going to do? Okay. Uh, and, and, and why do we select felons over um, uh, people that uh, are under guardianship? Because it's a lot easier to prove. It's a lot easier to document. So, so the guardianship issue is still a big issue and is being addressed. Okay, but this one was easy. All right, let's go uh, to the next clip here. We're running out of time. And I really respect the Minnesota Supreme Court and the justices there. And if they just see it as what this petition is, and this is simply what this petition is, justices, we want your court orders honored through the other branches of government. And justices, when you uh, affirm a felony restricting a person's right to vote, the election officials, including the Secretary of State, must honor that court order. If that quarter isn't honored, we are, not, uh, we are not ruled by law, and our elections are not full of integrity. It's the opposite. If you believe in the America that we believe in, you believe in this lawsuit, and we're going to win in the Minnesota Supreme Court, not because we're above average, not because we're extraordinary, but because we're right. And the right can prevail, and this petition it is an example where everyone needs to share the information about this petition because if we don't win, then there's something really wrong. Thank you so much. And we'll, take yeah. well uh, <laughs> fantastic. You got to watch that again. I mean, 
get this show, watch it again, tell your friends. It's going to be on YouTube. Uh, it'll be on tomorrow. It'll be up by tomorrow morning, I guess. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash speechless MN. And um, tell your friends to watch it. This is an education, and you'll be able to converse with your friends on this issue because of this now. Um, a lot of work has gone into this, uh, especially by Dan McGrath uh, from Minnesota Majority. And he now is speaking in response to what Eric Cardle has said. So let's hear what. Well said, Eric. Uh, very good presentation. Thanks for all your building, work you've building done on, on your, this. Building on your work, Dan. Yeah, you, you, you're doing really good work. Thank you. A <laughs> um, couple quick comments. Um, first, I want to say how proud I am of all the volunteers that did the research that led to this and um, express my frustration that it takes citizen groups like ours to do this kind of work. We elect people. We pay people a lot of money to run our government, and they're not doing this work. They don't seem to care. It's just a very frustrating situation for me that it requires citizen groups like this to police our own government. Very emotional uh, for him because it's been a long process. There's been multiple lawsuits going forward, coming back. You did this right. Court didn't do that right. You keep coming back, going different places. And as our, uh, Mr. Cardle said, we think the courts now know what's going on. They've been educated. We've been educated. We think we know what's going on. Okay, we need provisional ballots, bottom line. We need provisional ballots in our election process. All right, they had a uh, question and answer system, uh, uh, session. Uh, I asked one question on... Uh, how soon before the Minnesota Supreme Court hears this? If they hear it, it's within a 90-day time period uh, from certain filings and, and things taking place. Uh, but then another question was asked is whether they will hear it or whether they have to hear it. So let's hear this question. Dave, uh, does the Supreme Court have the authority or right to, like um, a lot of cases that are brought before the Supreme Court, they have a right to decide whether they even want to hear it. So is this something that they have to hear in this Arizona mission um, action that you're bringing, or is it something they can have discretion and say, we don't, we don't even want to hear it? Well, I think that's, uh, uh, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say it was an immediate concern when we picked up the case. But now we think the court uh, will hear it. Uh, there's no discretion really under the errors and mission sta statute, but there are jurisdictional concerns. And one of the reasons why we're focused, uh, you know, so small, less is more, on, on uh, court restrictions, uh, court restrictions via felony convictions and court restrictions regarding guardianship orders, is that uh, how can the court not want to administer justice? I mean, in other words, the court originates the court orders restricting the voters in these instances, and so the court has its own interest in ensuring that those are honored. Every contempt proceeding is about a person following a court order. So what are we going to do with these election officials? We're not going to hold them all in contempt. What we need to do is have a orderly process where the, the Minnesota Supreme Court says every election judge and the Secretary of State will follow these court orders. So hopefully that, hopefully the court values its own court orders. Okay, uh, Eric Carter, uh, one last statement from Eric Carter. we'll see here. Uh, let's, so let's play that uh, You know, that's kind of where we're at. You know, the people are now pitched against their government because the government isn't delivering excellent government. And so the people are in a position where if we want excellent government, we have to fight for it. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a scrap, it's a fight, it's a brawl. And uh, this is an example of a lawsuit where people have fought years for integrity in elections, and people don't understand why we just can't get it. And obviously the government has a problem uh, acceding to the people's wishes, and so the people have to take charge. It's no different than, than other places, right, like Andy was mentioning. And uh, I think the elections are so important uh, because it's just a, a little shot into the soul of your government, and if your government can't run clean elections, well, you've got a problem with your government. <laughs> 
Uh, do we have a problem with our government? I think so. We don't have clean elections here in Minnesota. Uh, and the people need to fight. And there are a lot of people who stepped up. Call your representatives, okay? Especially the House of Representatives. They have enough information, in my opinion, to go out and impeach Steve Simon because he's not following his constitutional duties. Okay? Now, Senate's controlled by the DFL. They won't try him. Okay? Your constitutional right for a clean election is being violated and nothing is happening. Now, uh, Mr. Selick takes this on to a national level here, so let's play him real quick. There's two high-ranking people in Minnesota um, that think that we have the best elections in the country. One is Congressman Keith Ellison, and one is, one is Senator Amy Klobuchar. In fact, they think Minnesota's current system, now whether they understand it or not, I don't know. But they are both behind bills at a national level to make Minnesota's system of same-day registration a national deal. Okay? And that, and that, and that, and so, but I don't want to get started on politics. You know, we do try to, uh, you know, focus on election integrity. It shouldn't be a DFL or a Republican issue. It really shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, ask Phyllis Kahn. Didn't she get into some battles where all of a sudden she wanted those verified? So, I, you know, I think that, I think we're all going to be better off I think as citizens in our state, if we can trust that the right person is in office serving us. All right, we're done, we're out of time. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's uh, liberties, who's gonna stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless, we'll see you next week. Bye.